Thanks for being here. I hope you all have had a good weekend. It's good to see you uh, out here for Bible class today. Uh, before we begin our, our Bible study, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Do we have any prayer requests or prayers of praise that we want to make known this morning? Nathaniel. Yeah, well, praise God for that. Thank you. Sue. Okay. Well, we'll give thanks for that as well. Uh, Barbara. Okay. I'm sorry you won't be here this morning. I'll pray for him. Anyone else? Yes, we will. Yeah. Okay. Um. Right. We actually did this past Wednesday, but we only had a couple. Uh, Nathaniel mentioned his coworker, and I know, Sue, you mentioned Chris Wednesday night, and I do not recall the third prayer request. I'm sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't write it down that night. So. Okay. Well, if there's no other um, prayer requests, Sue? Um, I just remembered a prayer request. Uh, some friends of ours live in an apartment complex right next to us, and their neighbors uh, just took in two uh, foster children, and they were asking for, you know, car seats and these kinds of things. And so I just want to pray. I don't, I don't know the neighbors' names, but I just want to pray that that whole transition goes well and that it's good for the children especially. Uh, Dorothy? Okay. Yeah, we will. And uh, let's continue to keep our brother Jeff in prayer as well with his fight with cancer. Okay, well, let's bow and uh, let's lift these situations up to the Lord. Dear Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thank you that we can open up your word. We pray that you bless this time, that our hearts and minds will be attentive and that we will um, grow and be brought into more full, a fuller understanding of what you have revealed to us through our time together this morning. Bless our time of worship as well. Father, we thank you for all the blessings you've given us over this past week. We thank you for all the ways that you fill our lives every day, even ways that we perhaps take for granted or don't notice. And we thank you that you've given us another day today. Lord, we want to lift up those we mentioned this morning. There are also others perhaps in our bulletin or other prayer requests that went unspoken that we want to acknowledge before you. But right now, we especially want to lift up Nathaniel's co-worker, Rob. We're, we give you praise and thanks that his surgery went well, that we prayed about on Wednesday. And we pray you'll bless him in his recovery, that that will go just as smoothly. We want to lift up Sue's brother, Chris. We give you praise that uh, the amputation of, of his toe went well, and we pray that as he recovers, you'll bless him. Uh, we're grateful that he is, um, it lo it's looking like he can come home tomorrow. We pray that he will be able to. We want to pray for our brother, Craig, who's not able to be with us this morning, suffering from a cold. We pray that you'll bless his health, that you'll restore him, so that he can do the things he was intending to do this coming week, and so that he can be back with us soon. Father, continue to bless Doris' husband, Tenny. Watch over his health with his heart situation and 
We want to continue to pray for Doris as she takes care of him. Uh, we're thankful for the love and devotion she, so, she shows him. We're grateful that she's able to be with us this morning. Bless Joby's nephew who had a bad motorcycle accident uh, and who's in Louisville. And as he's in really rough shape right now, we pray that you'll keep him safe. We pray that the doctors and nurses tending to him will be able to take good care of him and that he'll be able to heal in good time. We also want to pray for Lori Bradley, who uh, just discovered she has breast cancer. Bless her with the shock of this news and any fear she may be feeling. Uh, we pray that you bless the doctors and nurses as they prepare a path forward and that you will bless her, that you'll bring her through this and, and bless her health. Lord, we also want to lift up our brother Jeff Barnett as he has been dealing with cancer for some time now and is now in hospice care. Bless our brother Shirley as he takes care of Jeff and we pray that you will bless Jeff every day to know your peace and love and presence, to know he's loved by this church family and to know he's loved by you most of all. And Lord, I also want to pray for some neighbors of, uh, of mine who just took in two foster children. We pray that you will bless those uh, neighbors as they watch over those children and, and, and guard them and oversee them, at least for the time being. We pray that this is a good situation for these children as well. Lord, uh, as we again look into your word this morning, we pray you bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> well, our study in Luke left off last week with Jesus in the midst of some really fierce controversy with the religious leaders in the Jerusalem temple. We're nearing the end of Jesus' um, ministry, nearing the end of his, of his earthly life. And this is where we are now. He's in some fierce controversy in the temple. So we read how Jesus drove out those engaging in corrupt business practices in the temple. And then after he does that, he begins teaching right there in the temple. And the religious leaders are angry enough about this to want to kill him. But they can't just swoop in and do away with Jesus because Jesus is so popular with the people. So they have to... Um, think strategically in how they're going to go about dealing with Jesus. And the religious leaders, what they do, instead of trying to just do away with him right then and there, they begin challenging Jesus with these different questions in public, trying to catch him. So they ask him where his authority comes from. They ask him about paying taxes to Caesar. And with each one of these challenges, um, they are trying to set traps for Jesus so that no matter how he answers, he will be in big trouble. So that no matter how he answers, um, he will incriminate himself, and that would give the religious leaders the ability to, to take care of him. But Jesus manage, manages to avoid that trap each time, and he actually replies in a way that the religious leaders are unable to answer. So he, he's so far been handling himself really well in that regard. And so we have one more uh, dispute with the religious leaders uh, to read this morning. And then after that last dispute, Jesus is actually done defending himself, and he then goes on the offensive, and he has some things to say to the religious leaders in, this is kind of like a war of words going on that we're reading about right now. And so Jesus, as, as he does that, he's going to say some things about himself. Uh, he's basically going to, to say to the crowds and to the leaders that there is far more to him, there's far more to Jesus than meets the eye. Uh, and there's more to him than even what the Jews expected of their Messiah. And Jesus is also going to say some critical things about the religious leaders. As he goes on the offensive in this confrontation, in this war of words, he's going to expose their hearts. So they've, they've been debating and discussing, disputing over various controversial issues, but Jesus is going to go behind those issues or underneath those issues and expose the hearts of the people who are challenging him. And so I'm calling these disputes a war of words, and I think that's actually a really good way to think about what we're reading here. Because these are not just debates where there's a winner or a loser declared. Maybe you've seen public debates before. Maybe you've been part of a debate team in school or something. These are not debates where there's just a winner or a loser declared and then everyone can just go home and that's the end of it. These are also not like debates on social media where people are going back and forth and they're pretty nasty and it just keeps going until someone gets tired and someone stops and then everyone just goes on about their lives. Um, instead, with, with what we're reading here, Jesus' life is really on the line with these debates. Uh, his choice of words could determine um, whether or not the people turn against him. His choice of words could determine if Rome is going to swoop in and, and, and deal with him. Uh, so the stakes are really high. 
And so Jesus, again, because he's Jesus, he handles himself beautifully, and he also imparts some really great wisdom to us along the way. So we'll keep on reading this uh, this morning. So the next challenge comes from the Sadducees. This is a different group of religious leaders than the Pharisees. We actually have not seen the Sadducees in the Gospel of Luke yet, because the Sadducees are located specifically in Jerusalem. Pharisees are more spread out. Sadducees are located in Jerusalem. And in Luke, Jesus hasn't been in Jerusalem until this chapter. So we're just now encountering them. But the Sadducees deny a belief that is fundamental to us as Christians. Without this belief, there's not much of a Christian faith left. But they deny this belief. They deny that one day there will be a resurrection from the dead. And they deny this, they deny that there will be a resurrection because for them, the authority of Scripture, God's Word, is found strictly in the first five books of our Old Testament, Genesis through Deuteronomy. All scriptural truth for the Sadducees must come from uh, those five books. And those books don't really say much of anything about the resurrection, or at least they they don't think it does. Jesus is actually going to indicate otherwise. But as they read those five books, they don't really see anything in, these, in, in those uh, passages in those books about resurrection. Uh, now Jesus, of course, he believes in resurrection, and he's made that very clear. He's even talked about to his disciples how he is going to die, and then he's going to rise again. So he certainly believes in resurrection. So the Sadducees are going to challenge Jesus' belief on this issue, and they're going to do this by appealing to the, book, the only books that are authoritative to them. They're going to appeal to those first five books of the Bible. And what they're going to try to show Jesus before all these other people so they can kind of catch him. What they're going to try to show is that resurrection belief is incompatible with what these five books teach. That's what they're going to try to do. So let's see how they do this and let's read Jesus' reply. Uh, first, let's just read what they say. Would someone be willing to read um, verses 27 through 33? volunteers. Sue? There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will be the woman, or whose wife will be the uh, woman be? For the seven had her as wife. All right, thank you, Sue. So the Sadducees, they, they anchor their objection to the belief in resurrection, in a particular law from the law of Moses. And the law is that if an Israelite man dies, and he's married, and he has no child, then his brother must marry his widow and provide her with a child. Now, I know this probably sounds really strange to us, uh, really strange. And um, But as strange as this is to us, this is actually a way to protect the widow from falling on hard times. We've talked before about how vulnerable widows are, and if time allows, we'll talk about that some more this, this morning as we get later, later on in the, in the text. But if she has a son, then that son will grow up and help make ends meet for her. So this is actually a way to protect the widow. Uh, it, also continues, it also honors the deceased husband. It continues the family line. It can provide him with an heir. So that, that's the motivation behind this law. But anyways, the Sadducees, as they turn to this law, they propose a pretty absurd scenario. So they talk about, well, there's this man who has six brothers, and uh, he takes a wife, and then he dies, and then each brother proceeds to try to follow the law uh, to provide a widow for this child, or provide a child for the widow, but each one dies before that could happen, and then last of all, the widow dies. So the question is, well, if there is a resurrection, then when all of these people raise from the dead, which of the seven brothers will have her as a wife in, in the resurrection life? That's what, they're, that's what they're asking. So this probably, I hope to us, this does sound a little bit absurd because this probably never happened. Uh, I mean, what are the odds that all seven brothers would die 
before, before uh, being able to provide that widow with a child. But that's what they propose. So let's read now the first part of Jesus' uh, response. This is kind of short, so would you be willing to just read this as well, Sue? Thank you. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. All right. So Jesus basically says here that the Sadducees have assumed that life after resurrection will operate the same way life operates now. But Jesus says, actually, it's going to operate very differently. So life now in the present operates with people marrying and people being given in marriage, but life after the resurrection will not have any need of marriage because those who are resurrected, Jesus says, will not die anymore. So thinking specifically about the situation the Sadducees pose, when Jesus says people will not die anymore, this means there's no threat of a family line dying out. This means there's no threat of a widow falling on hard times because these people are going to live forever. So the circumstances that, that motivated the six brothers to, to keep uh, taking on this widow, those circumstances will not exist anymore. And he says instead, those who are resurrected will be like angels who have no need of marriage. Is that just what Jesus says? Is it making sense to us? Any questions on what he says before we keep going? Go ahead, Barbara. Is there somewhere else in the Bible where it says that there's no male or female in heaven? Or is that just a interpretation from this definition? I don't believe there's anything that says no male or female. I think it says that they will be like, it just says they will be like angels. Yeah. I don't believe, if you all want to do some Bible searching and fact check me on this, I don't believe so. And, and when angels appear to humans in scripture, they're referred to with like, you know, male pronouns and stuff. So, you know, Gabriel, Michael, and okay. so on. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I'm trying to think of what to say. <laughs> Some of this has to do with just how we in interpret what we're given about the spiritual world. Um, God, of course, is presented as a father. Male pronouns are used for him. Some people will argue that God does not himself actually have a gender because he's God. Um, but he, that is the way he presents himself to humans. Others will say, well, actually, that language suggests, I mean, he's, he, we should really take it seriously, you know, and, and they would, I think you could just apply the same different ways of reading the evidence to angels. But, but I, from here, I don't think we could say that humans will have no gender in heaven. Uh, uh, Chris? Yeah. 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 So, so Paul there, he's talking about in the church today, and uh, he's basically trying to say that the social barriers that, that go up between people and culture do not apply in the church. Uh, but he's not saying that, you know, actually he's quite adamant. Jews can still be Jews in the church, and Gentiles can still be Gentiles. It's just the division shouldn't be there. And so, he, yeah, same would apply to male and female. Uh, Norma. Right. 
That's exactly what Jesus is trying to get at. Uh, not trying, getting at. Yeah, that's exactly what he's trying to get at. Sue? Um, when you were talking about where this story came from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. They claim that the prophet, after it all came back in the third one, that the woman is cursed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Sue is talking about a, a book in the Old Testament Apocrypha called Tobit. Uh, you can read Tobit. It's easily accessible. You can probably find it online for free. Maybe if you want, read Tobit someday. Tobit is, uh, if you read it, it's clear, and, and Jews, I think, took it this way. It's, it's like a fun adventure story. It's not trying to say these people really lived and all this happened. But there's a scenario where there's a character who has married multiple men. They're not all brothers like in this, but he's married multiple men, and the men keep dying on the wedding night. And, and the reason is there's a demon involved. And so an angel appears to Tobit's son, who's one of the main characters, and he's going to marry this woman. And the angel t tells Tobit's son, hey, here's what you need to do to get rid of the demon. And they do. And then, to uh, I can't remember, Tobias, maybe is his name. I don't know. But he and Sarah have a happy life. So, yeah, so it is. So this, uh, what seems so absurd to us, it's still absurd, but... There were other stories that kind of did this kind of thing in Jewish culture when the Sadducees told it. Thanks for making that contribution. All right, so um, let's see. We are ready now for the second part of Jesus' answer. So uh, let's read this. Would anyone care to read verses 37 through 40? Thank you, Ron. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Te Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. All right. Thank you, Ron. So in the last passage that we just read, Jesus showed the Sadducees that they've made a bad assumption about the resurrection life. And now in, in the passage that Ron just read, he goes a step further by trying to demonstrate that the first five books of the Bible, and again, those are the only books that for the Sadducees um, that they accept as authoritative scripture, the first five books of the Bible actually do support the idea of resurrection. So if Jesus wanted to make things really easy on himself, he could have said, hey, turn to Daniel chapter 12. Now, they didn't have chapters, but you know what I'm saying. Because uh, Daniel 12 is one of the clearest statements about the resurrection in the Old Testament. But again, he's talking to the Sadducees. Sadducees would not have accepted that answer. Uh, because again, authority for them goes back to those first five books. So Jesus, he meets them where they are. He meets the Sadducees where they're at in their understanding. And he focuses on a passage from those books to make his case. So he points out how uh, when God appears to Moses in the burning bush, he called himself the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now, all three of those figures have been long dead by the time God appears uh, to Moses. But God, Jesus says, God is not the God of uh, the dead. He's the God of the living. Now, to the Sadducees, because they do not believe in resurrection, dying basically means ceasing to exist. But if you think about it, God cannot really be God over what does not exist, can he? But he says here, I'm God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if God says he's God of these people, then they must still exist. They must live on after death. So that's what Jesus does. It's, it's quite clever, <laughs> the, what, the way Jesus turns to this passage to, uh, to talk about resurrection. And the scribes really like Jesus' answer. That's because the scribes who have appeared in Luke, uh, often along with the Pharisees, uh, they would believe in resurrection, unlike the Sadducees. Uh, so they actually, uh, even though they're out to, to get Jesus, they're like, oh, wow, we really like what you have to say on that, uh, Jesus. And so it, with this exchange between Jesus and the Sadducees, this war of words that Jesus is engaged in is basically over, uh, or at least the, the religious leader's attack on Jesus is over. Luke tells us that after that exchange, they no longer dare to ask him any more questions. And we've read the other questions last week. 
They no longer dare to ask him any more questions because it's clear that they have met their match with Jesus. Um, they, they realize a little bit more about who they're dealing with. But even though the Sadducees and Pharisees and all of them are done asking Jesus, Jesus questions, uh, in our next passage, Jesus is actually going to go on the offensive, and he actually has some things to say to them. But before we move on, this is a good place to pause. I know we've already had some discussion, but are there any other questions or reflections on uh, this passage before we keep on going? All right. So Jesus now has some extra words to say to the religious leaders, and he also has these words to say to anyone who's listening uh, to this exchange uh, going on between them. And what he says next might seem really strange to us at first, because Jesus seems to call into question the idea that the Messiah is descended from King David. Now that probably seems like a really strange thing for us to call into question. We're probably thinking, well, of course the Messiah is descended from David. This is something that the Old Testament talks about. This is something that the New Testament talks about. But Jesus is going to call it into question anyway, uh, as strange as that might seem. And I think we'll see that what Jesus is doing, uh, he tries to plant a seed in people's minds that is meant to give them a fuller understanding of who he really is. So let's read what Jesus says next. Uh, would someone like to read verses 41 through 44? Go ahead, Doris. But he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? For David himself in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? All right. So everyone says that the Christ, that the Messiah, is the son of David. And again, this is something the Old Testament talks about. This is something the New Testament talks about. And Luke himself even talks about it. He's made it clear at different points along the gospel uh, that Jesus is descended from David. And I've got a few examples on the screen here. Uh, this third one might seem strange. That's because it's part of Jesus' genealogy. But these are just three examples where Luke even comes out and says, yes, Jesus is the Messiah and he's descended uh, from David. So in light of all of that, especially in light of what Luke himself says, Jesus must not be trying to actually deny uh, that he is descended from David. He must be trying to do something else as he asks this question. So what is the something else he's trying to do? Well, what he says here I think can help us some. Uh, he quotes from the Psalms uh, where David writes, uh, he says, this is from Psalm 110, says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my feet and, until I make your enemies your footstool. All right, so the first Lord here, would refer to God, and uh, the second Lord is referring to someone else. Um, and, and Jesus takes David to be referring, as he writes these words, to be referring to the Christ, to be referring to the Messiah. So God says to David's Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And so Jesus asks the question, all right, well, how could it be that David calls his son and, of course, there'd be a lot of greats in front of it, great, 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 great grandson. But how could it be that David calls his son Lord? Because no father refers to their sons or grandsons this way. And notice that Jesus does not actually answer the question. He throws the question out there, and he leaves it for the religious leaders to ponder and to think about. And for that matter, because he doesn't answer the question, he leaves it open for us to think about. So let's think about it for a second. Um, what do we think? How would we answer Jesus' question in verse 44? Any thoughts? Barbara? Oh, microphone's coming up to you. Sorry. Where the father would serve the son. Mm. That's the mm -hmm. only thing I can think of is it's not in their culture to accept that the hierarchy comes from the bottom up. Mm. Yeah, good point. I do think that's something that would be very hard for them to think about. Anybody else? Well, uh, okay, Norma, go ahead.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree that that is definitely what he's doing. He is throwing a question out there so they can think about it and kind of come to the conclusion themselves, which is safer and also more effective than Jesus having to just tell them. Any other thoughts? So I think uh, at least a big part of the answer is Jesus is indicating he must be more than just the son of David. He's not denying that he is, but he's saying there is more to me than that. Uh, he clearly is descended from David. I mean, Luke has made that super clear. The rest of the New Testament, Old Testament, it all makes it clear. But Jesus is saying that must not be all it means to be the Messiah. Something about the Messiah is greater than David, and that's why David can call him Lord. And that would mean if something about the Messiah is greater than David, then what he's going to do as the Messiah is greater than anything King David ever did. And as Christians now, looking at this whole thing 2,000 years later with the whole New Testament in front of us, uh, we can look back and see how true it is that Jesus is greater than David. Uh, we can see how, you know, what he's accomplished in the cross and the resurrection and the ascension, uh, establishing his church. Um, these things are greater, way greater than what, when, what David accomplished. So Jesus is here, again, he's planting seeds for these kinds of thoughts in the minds of the religious leaders and in the minds of anyone who's, who's listening. Um, so basically, Jesus is telling them he is way bigger than they realize. Uh, he is, he's way bigger, he's way more significant than they can currently understand. So the religious leaders don't know who they're messing with when they, when they mess with Jesus. He's, uh, he's greater than David. All right, any, any other reflections or thoughts on this before we keep on going? All right, so Jesus next turns his attention directly to the disciples who are there in the temple listening to all of this, and he has some things to say about the scribes. Uh, notice that, let's see, just a little while ago, I have to go back, um, the scribes spoke really well of what Jesus just said, so you think that might persuade Jesus to be a little nice to the scribes, uh, but it, it doesn't. Uh, he still has some pretty severe words for them. So let's read this. Uh, I saw your hand go up earlier, Barbara. Yeah, if you could read verses 45 through 47. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. All right. So Jesus has some pretty strong words to the disciples about the scribes. Uh, it's worth mentioning that Jesus has given this kind of warning to his disciples before. Um, on the screen right here is uh, part of Luke 12 and verse 1 where he tells the disciples to beware of the Pharisees, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees because it's hypocrisy. Uh, and Jesus basically says the same thing here. He just goes into more detail as he talks about the scribes. So he says that the scribes, he basically says, the scribes love honor. Uh, we've talked before in here about how important honor was in Jesus' culture. We've talked about honor a lot in here. So they love their nice, long robes. Uh, they love receiving really honorable greetings in the marketplaces um, for being you know, really respectable, holy, religious men. Uh, they love the prominent seats in the synagogue, the, the seats of honor. They love the seats of honor at feasts. Um, actually, several chapters ago, when Jesus was dining at the house of a Pharisee, uh, he actually told a parable to those who fit this description, those who love the really honorable seats at banquets. So we've seen this kind of criticism before uh, coming from Jesus. So the scribes really love their honor and their status and their reputation, but notice what they actually do. Because they have all this honor and reputation, but what they do, they devour widows' houses, and they make, uh, for a pretense, they make long prayers. So we were talking just earlier with, with the Sadducees, as they were trying to challenge Jesus, about how widows were very vulnerable people. 
in Jesus' time. Uh, so these are the kinds of people, widows, these are the kinds of people the religious leaders should be seeking to protect, uh, but instead they are taking advantage of them. And he doesn't, exa- he doesn't say exactly how, how they do this. They might do this through excessive tithing of them or something like that. Uh, we'll actually see in our next passage, which I think time will allow, uh, one way that this might be happening. But the law of Moses, which the scribes would take very seriously, the law of Moses has a lot of instructions about it, in it about caring for the orphan and the widow. So the scribes are just flat out disobeying those passages by the way that they're living. And while they're doing that, as they're taking advantage of those who are uh, vulnerable, they're also making these really lengthy, these really ornate prayers to God that give the appearance of being very devout. So the scribes, they love their honor, they take advantage of those who are marginalized and vulnerable, and they put on a really good show of devout faith. So when we think about these criticisms, we have seen many times throughout our whole study of Luke how Jesus conducts his ministry in exactly the opposite way. This is exactly the way, exactly opposite the way Jesus behaves. He has preached and taught so much about not falling in love with our own honor and status and reputation. And as we've read his ministry, as people have come to him, as he's gone to people and performed miracles, we've read him engage in ministry with widows and the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. So the very people the scribes take advantage of, those people are the focus of Jesus' ministry. So it's unsurprising. Try to put yourself in Jesus' shoes. You've been doing ministry for a couple of years to all these people, preaching about not loving your honor, and the religious leaders who the people look up to are, are living the complete opposite. Like Jesus would be furious, and we would be furious too. And so it makes sense that he says what he says at the very end. They will receive the greater uh, condemnation. They will have to answer for the way they have used their positions of power and influence to take advantage of people and to make themselves look good instead of using those things to honor God and and to serve others uh, with humility. So this passage is a good reminder to us how seriously God takes how we use our positions of influence and how we use our abilities. He will hold us accountable if we use them to prop ourselves up, if we use those things to walk on others as we ascend some type of social ladder or something like that. Uh, He will hold us accountable for that. He expects us to use the opportunities we're given, the positions we're given in society. He expects us to use those things to bless those uh, who have need, who have the most need of what we have to offer. And that's what the scribes are failing to do. Any questions or thoughts on Jesus' words to the scribes? Bob, go ahead. Uh, Yeah, if you could pass the microphone back, Barbara. You know, sometimes we use our strategies or use our appearance or uh, the dress codes or the speeches that we uh, say and do. But uh, the the bottom line is God looks at what? God looks at our heart, doesn't he? And man look at the outward appearance. So we shouldn't take advantage of people because of our status quo. And a lot of times we are in that position to do that, but we should not do that. That's right. This is an ongoing, this is something humans have wrestled with forever. And uh, the church, for that matter, I mean, church history has examples of this being violated as well. And there are people in church today who violate this teaching. So it's something to always take very seriously. Okay, well, I think time will allow us to get to the final passage I want us to look at this morning. The final passage rounds out this whole section of disputes, a war of words that Jesus is engaged with. It's the first four verses of chapter 21. So it's really fitting that right after Jesus has accused the scribes of devouring widows' houses, we read of a widow, and she gives away everything that she has. So let's read this. Uh, Would someone care to read Luke 21, 1 through 4? O'Brien, thank you. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. 
And he said, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Okay. So here in this passage, we have two kinds of people making offerings in the temple. We have the rich, and we have a poor widow. And the rich, of course, would be giving some pretty generous donations that the temple would love. You know, it's great when people make big offerings, uh, and this would support the running of the temple. The widow, on the other hand, Luke says, only has two copper coins to offer. And actually, the Greek word for the two copper coins refers to currency that would basically be like a, a penny in our modern-day currency. So this is not much at all. This is not a contribution that would really make a difference, a substantial difference about anything uh, that this woman gives. But Jesus says that this poor woman, this poor widow, has made a greater contribution because she gave everything that she had. So the rich... He talks about how they gave what they gave out of their abundance. And so their contribution, their, their offering, probably will not affect their standard of living very much at all. You know, they're not going to hurt by giving what they're giving because they're so wealthy. But the widow, she gave out of her poverty and she gave away all that she had. So this is truly, I mean, this is a sacrificial gift that the widow offers. So there's two things I think that we can see happening in this passage when we read it in context of what we've been reading. So on the one hand, we can see an example of beautiful faith in this widow. Her, her gift to God out of her poverty is a powerful expression of her trust in God. She's going to give what little she has to God and to the running of, of his dwelling place on earth, the temple. And so she must be trusting that that, that God is going to take care of her. So on the one hand, we can see that beautiful example of faith. On the other hand, this whole scenario that Jesus watches unfold in the temple, this whole scenario may show us one way that the religious leaders devour widows' houses that he was just talking about uh, in the last passage. Because this widow, this widow should be the one receiving generosity, not the one extending generosity. Uh, but the temple... Those who run the temple, I mean, they need money to run the temple, and they're just happy to receive donations from whoever without discrimination. They're just like, okay, if you want to give, we're not going to stop you. You can give. Um, but God's people would honor God by using their funds to support someone like this widow uh, instead of using their funds to continue to, to uphold this really beautiful, ornate, elaborate temple. And we'll talk about it some next week. The temple truly was luxurious, and so it did take quite a bit of funds. Uh, to run. So perhaps the rich who were making their contribution here, perhaps the rich should have used their money uh, to help the widow who was right next to them instead of using that money uh, to give it uh, as a contribution to the temple. So um, this passage closes out uh, Jesus' confrontation with the religious leaders. And as we close, I, I know the, the second bell is going to ring for, in a moment. I'd like us to notice something about this whole war of words that Jesus has been engaged in. So it began uh, by Jesus cleansing the temple and calling the temple a den of robbers. That's right after that we read these disputes. And then it ends with this woman giving away all that she has um, to the temple. And so this is a really good reminder. Right? as these, these two things kind of serve like bookends for all the disputes that we've read in between. This is a really good reminder that what's going on as Jesus debates with the religious leaders they're not just abstract theological discussions that don't actually change much uh, at the end of the day. As Jesus opposes them, uh, he is opposing a whole religious system that has basis in Scripture and should operate a certain way, but it's not operating the way God intends for it to operate. Uh, if, if the religious leaders were operating the way they would, uh, that they should, that widow should not have been in the position to give away all she had to live on, um, but she was. And so... This is a good reminder that Jesus is truly doing something of great importance as he debates with the religious leaders. So any final questions or thoughts before we dismiss this morning? Chris.
Ah, yeah. Yeah. Great, great question. Yeah, because Peter, he would have been here overhearing all of this, and then only, what, a couple months later, he would say what he says in Acts 2. Yeah, great, great observation. That passage, Psalm 110, is actually a, one of the key passages in the whole Old Testament for understanding who Jesus is. Like, the New Testament writers turn to that passage a lot, not just in that that uh, passage that we read. All right, well, uh, I know the bell's about to ring, so we'll dismiss now and um, have worship in a little bit. Thank you.